not crunching so much. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Laurie Skelly, who is, um, has a background in uh, neuroscience. She did her PhD in integrative neuroscience at the University of Chicago. And she actually formally did brain scanning and she uh, worked with us in Connecticut at the Brain Imaging Center there. And um, she has uh, since sort of focused on uh, working with all kinds of interesting data problems and taking some of the skill sets she learned from uh, one field and translated it into uh, a different field. And I think, you'll, uh, uh, I think you'll be interested in some of the experiences she's had and some of the uh, interesting problems that she's uh, solved. She's working for a company called Datascope Analytics in Chicago right now. And thank you so much for coming out. And without further ado, welcome. I forget the title of it, but I think it was a good one. You dim the lights for you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Vince. Um, so, again, I'm Laurie Skelly. I uh, am a data, a data scientist at Data School Analytics. And years ago, I was sitting where you are sitting today only in a different state, so this is kind of analogous to where you're sitting today. Uh, I was at the Olin Center in Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, I did my undergraduate thesis there and stuck around for three years and then escaped to grad school. I'd been at grad school for, I think, a year and a half, and my advisor came back from a NIH study section meeting and he said, we're going to do this great new study and I want you to do it, Lori. We're going to work with this guy. He's got this mobile scanner. His name is Ken Peel, and you're going to scan some psychopaths with him. I said, oh, great. So I can't stay away from this place, and uh, I wouldn't want to anyway. Um, anyway, so I've been uh, talking to a lot of people here today, and I've learned a lot about what's, uh, what you guys are getting into. It's really exciting, and I obviously am biased. Um, and the good news is if I, I, uh, if I design this talk knowing what I know now, I would have made it pretty much the same. So I, uh, it's about, you know, I have my perspective working for Datascope and coming from my background. So that's um, going to be the central focus of it uh, and sharing just some of the basic things that differ between my life as an academic researcher and my life as a data scientist, and I hope you'll find it interesting. Okay, so at the end of my grad school career, I had a little bit of a problem because it was a, kind of an existential crisis, and I just did not have it in me to do the postdoc search and move to three more cities and maybe get a medium well-paying job for very low prestige, and I was about out of gas and I didn't know what to do. Um, so if I wasn't going to use the PhD that I was getting for what I planned to use it for, I didn't know what to do. You know, people were like, oh, so you're going to go into industry? And I just had like this vague idea of what that even meant. There's like these like pharma companies like, that had these giant parking lots. I just imagine like walking across the parking lot in the heat to just be, you know, pipetting for eight or ten hours a day. And uh, I just, it didn't seem right either. Um, so I started doing a little bit more digging, um, and eventually I found out about data science. And it was appealing. Um, it seems like a smoother transition. There were a lot of things I was looking at. I was like, oh, maybe I'll go work in a museum. Maybe I'll work with kids. Maybe I'll, you know, and then I found that like people go to school for those things, and I would not be a very competitive candidate. But this data science thing seemed to be um, nicely applicable. Um, so just to give you a little bit of what I was up to in um, with brain, right? So I just put in a couple of figures from my papers because that was really the part I liked the most anyway. I, uh, I realized like near the end, oh my gosh, come on, hi, hi. Uh, <laughs> that uh, the, the, doing the figures in my paper was really my favorite part. I like taking a really complicated idea and trying to communicate it really efficiently to people um, from a broad array of backgrounds. I always imagine those like freshmen who had to read papers in undergrad, looking at it, and getting something out of it, you know. Um, and I, I really enjoyed that part, and I didn't like going back and having to do like the lit reviews and write grants and all the but the, um, the figures I like. So that's the part that I put in here. 
Um, so this one was the very first paper I ever did. Uh, and this was, um, we were looking at DTI in, um, in schizophrenia. There are a bunch of areas where they were different. They were located in white matter tracts and beyond that, I mean, there wasn't like a fun sum up story, which is why I wasn't in science. Um, and then in uh, grad school, I started doing some more like network-based analyses. Um, this is the favorite figure I ever did. And um, there's just so much information in this figure and it's still like visually like insanely confusing, but it's way better than the first run through I did. And it even had a little like secret smiley face in it because I we had to take a lot of psychology in our in our program, and so I thought that maybe that would you know subconsciously bias the reviewers to let our paper through a little bit easier. Um, and then uh, this is the most recent one, uh, and we were looking at uh, this is the anterior insula and having greater activation, uh, increasing with the level of psychopathy. Uh, when they are looking at interactions where someone's getting hurt and facial expressions of pain. Um, and still, I am the most excited about like the cool blue and yellow colors in the face. I mean, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but it really was a nice vacation for me. And, and there's this little inkling of a thought. I was like, well, maybe there's something with that that I can do. Um, so long story short, I ended up finding a company called uh, Datascope Analytics. And, um, hadn't happened, I don't even really remember. If you are interested in leaving, like branching out on your own and, and leaving academia and finding the career path that's right for you, I think that's a different talk than this one. Um, but it involved talking to humans who are different than you, getting the heck away from scientists and uh, learning about the rest of the world. It's super different. Um, uh, and the company that I found, it's just, the, I truly believe it's the perfect fit for me. I don't know how I found them. I think it's a miracle, but uh, I'm really having a great time here. Uh, so we are a small data design and consulting firm We're based in Chicago. There are eight of us now. I think I was, oh, there are nine of us now. I think at the end of the summer we'll be 11. Uh, it was started by two guys who were in the same lab at Northwestern. We have some physics guys, some chemical, en a chemical engineering guy, a statistician lady, a mathematician dude, uh, an MBA, and... Uh, next I don't know what Vlad is he starts next week um, but everybody is awesome and what we do uh, we uh, kind of work at the intersection of uh, doing analytics consulting and design and just to uh, give a little context on design um, that includes things that you might you know think of most readily with the design like making the colors pretty and hand doodling the things but also about like the design of a problem you know so how are we going to approach your problem are you asking the right questions what are the resources available to you how are we going to go from uh, problem to solution or from uh, less money to more money um, so all kinds of different design and uh, consulting so we're not just being handed a data set and they said we want you to run this kind of analysis on it and have it back to us uh, we help them to decide what they need to do as well um, and then, you know, this actually is meaningful because we are that nerdy that, we'll, <coughs> that we will do work at this intersection of two and this intersection of two, but not really here because that's not the job. Um, we get to work with really cool companies. Um, we work with other consulting companies. Uh, we are Coca-Cola, uh, Motorola. There are companies that I can't put on here that are even more impressive. That's the unfortunate deal with working with really impressive companies is the more valuable they'd be on there on that list of people, the less likely they are to let you. Um, this one was like a big win. They're really excited, uh, but still, like that's a really impressive group of companies for just the eight of us to be able to do projects with. Um, and every project that we do is really different. Um, so we're always getting different kinds of data sets, different kinds of problems, um, and. For a person who's curious and likes doing fun and novel things, it's great. As a business model, it has its pluses and minuses. Um, it's expensive to always be doing something different. Um, so in the transition, I had to make from being in neuroscience research uh, to being a data scientist, there were some things that made the transition um, easier and some things that I had to adjust to. 
And so I thought that that would be kind of the structure of the rest of this talk. I think that people are best set up for success in doing data science from an academic background if they are aware of their strengths. Um, I think that the focus becomes really quickly on um, machine learning and algorithms and the very technical stuff. But we actually have a lot of skills that apply to data science um, that you might not realize are in your, in your hand of cards right off the bat. And there are other things that require adjustments and um, hopefully I can save you some, some time and some gaps that we talk about them today. So um, I'm gonna go through all three of these. Um, basically that a research project and a data science project have a similar lifespan, um, going from birth to completion. Uh, we're trained in this idea of doing something next week that we don't know how to do today. We can go from Googling it to expert in a faster amount of time than most people. Uh, and that's a skill that you have. Um, so if people ask you if you can do something and the answer is no, but I can Google it, the answer is it's yes, it's fine. You know, and that's kind of the expectation of, of data science. One. Um, and then you do have some of the tools that are the actual meat and potatoes of doing data science already. So that one's kind of a, a more obvious one. And the differences, I started out with, with three differences within this talk that's going to be about two hours long. So um, measuring your success and, and finding different ways of, of thinking about your funding models, they all collapse nicely into what it's like to work with clients. Because um, that's a big adjustment and it has a lot of nuances. So I'll just go through some of these. And on the way, I'll have some examples about um, things that we've done uh, at Datascope to illustrate them. All right, so for product, project art, and this is similar in, to academic research as well as data science, uh, you start with some kind of question or problem or conception. You design what you're going to do to answer that question or tackle that problem. Then you have to implement it. These are separate things. And at the end, you have to talk about what happened. And there's interpretation in there, but I just kind of am gluing that in with communication. Okay, so how does a data scientist do this? And I don't know if you guys have all checked this out, but probably a lot of you are familiar uh, with this Kaggle contest um, that some of you are probably very involved in. Um, and this is a, um, Kaggle, for those of you who don't know, is a website, a company, and they host machine learning challenges. And so people can come, take big data sets, try out all their algorithms on it, just predictive modeling uh, and find out who's the king of the nerds and sometimes get glory, sometimes get cash and uh, it's really exciting but it's usually a very uh, narrow strip of what the actual problem is. And I think that they started to change it a little bit but they used to be calling it like data science contest which is pretty misleading because I would say that a data scientist is doing all of this work all the way through and the Kaggle is just that one little strip. So I think that they were really helping with that hyper focus on kind of machine learning and algorithms is what a data science does, data scientist does. And it's just one piece of it. All right, so you have to start out with a question or a problem. Um, in neuroscience, you know, we look at the literature, we look at what we did last week, we look at what they're funding in the NIH, we say, oh, there's my question. Um, in data science, this can be um, how can we make more money? Is this data we're sitting on worth something? Um, how do I find out why people aren't buying my widgets? Which people aren't buying my widgets? And moving on from there. Um, and so, this data science, uh, this capital competition is kind of like the covers both of them, and um, it was already baked into the problem. Okay, so from there we go into a design and. You know, if you think about it, like most projects that we do in in uh, lab meetings, you know, they uh, we do that design component. We just don't call it design. We don't brand it. We don't brag about being good at it. But we are good at taking something that's in my head and talking about it with my lab mates, drawing it out on the board, dividing it into pieces for people to tackle, and that's all a design problem. Um, so it's sort of a nomenclature adjustment as well as a. Uh, to focus on. Okay, um, so then you have to implement 
whatever you decide to do. And whether that is collecting data, I mean, I thought you guys were really gonna like that. I worked really hard on that Google. The guy, I was sticking out. I had to do a Google image search. It's pretty good though. Um, There's see, only four toes. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it's, it's a cartoon. Yes. And, then, and there's no button, so how did he get in there? <laughs> um, okay. So you implement it, you might collect data, you might find data, you might receive the data, you might write code, you might do all of these things together, uh, and that's the one that's the easiest comparison. Um, and at the end, you have findings, you interpret them, and you communicate them uh, in regular science, you have your journal articles, you give a nice talk, um, and this is where I get really excited and I'm gonna kind of step away from it for a second, because I think this is one of the biggest points of departure in, in data science versus regular science, and it's really fun, um, because I get to make information really useful for clients. So this is a actual dashboard, and I really tried to act here to like, thoroughly redacted so that you can't tell what's going on. Um, but this is uh, a data science problem that we worked with, uh, worked on with a company. And so they gave us all of their call center data. And so this is, by call center I mean um, my widget broke, you gotta fix it or send me a new one. Um, and they get lots of them. This looks like they're getting about 1,200 per day, so that's a lot. And if they want to find patterns in them, they need people who can do that. Um, this is not the most challenging data science problem ever. This is actually a, a classification problem. It's supervised learning, and uh, the classifier reads the label on it and assigns it to the label that it's labeled with. So we get very high accuracy to that fine. Already categorized as the joke. Okay. So, but they can't. They don't. They don't. Have, they can't work with that, right? They can't. It's just a database full of stuff. They can't see it. Um, so, a big part of what we do is to communicate their data, even though the analysis we've done is practically nil. Um, and so, this one, and we can highlight have them. Um, we can let them interact with it as well. So, in this one, there's a spike around May first. What's going on? This actually keeps scrolling. There's like, you know, 50 or something categories. And as you go down, like some of them don't have a spike and some of them do. So it's not just like some artifact. There's actually something going on. And I think that they had like a very a sale right then. And so everything went, went crazy except for certain things. Um, but they can react to things. You know, they can say, oh, well, we knew that there was a sale on this day, but what is this? And go in and look at what's going on. They can, um, Another thing that, I mean, one thing that's really interesting is uh, there's, there's a product cycle. You think that if you buy the same model of a product that, you know, if you buy it on January 1st and your friend buys it on September 1st, that you have the exact same phone, and it's not true. They're constantly fixing it and updating it, and when they can find and react to things a little bit earlier, they can save bazillions of dollars fixing problems in this cycle instead of the next one. So really simple things like these, these Histograms basically are uh, can save people a ton of money, and that means that they'll give it to you, which is great. Um, and so this has all kinds of cool features. I was learning. Um, we built this in uh, JavaScript in this package called um, Bootstrap. No, this isn't Bootstrap. This is the other one. Backbone um, and Chip D3 and a bunch of tools and. So we were learning, I mean, I'm learning how to code on this thing and it's actually in use in one of those really big companies, um, which is just amazing. And uh, I don't know anything other than data science where you can just uh, learn stuff on the job and, and it be useful so quickly. Um, so, I don't know, it's another plug. Uh, this is a, a project, we, we get to do projects uh, that are fun um, so that people will look at our website and know who we are, which is awesome. So. Uh, the year I started, the Blackhawks were doing really well, and there was this interesting thing that any time um, that, that a team had gone a certain number of games without losing, they'd gone on to win the Stanley Cup, and so people were asking questions about that, and like, the, was there an actual effect? So 
we made this dashboard and you could you know pull on these sliders and these go up and down and the spins and I mean it's just really neat to just go crazy and these oh these even like are grammatically correct when they change and it was really fun to build it and it had no purpose whatsoever and I got paid to do it so this slide is just for me bragging right now <laughs> Uh, this is another one that my, um, my friend Bo and I did. We challenged each other to do something simple because every time we tried to make something, it got so many pieces that it wasn't very simple. This one's not simple either, but we tried. And this is looking at um, dresses on the red carpet for at the Academy Awards. And it, again, it's useless, but it's really fun. And people come play with it. And we got way better at playing with tools for representing data. Um, and this is just like what designer uh, the actress is wearing and whether they want or not and then she voted some statistics on it if you go uh, on our website you can find it and we were trying to see if, if there were certain you know lucky designers the answer was no it's a really small data set um, but it was fun okay so okay so that's the project arc so going from uh, having a, a question to communicating the results. All those are really familiar. And there's a lot of different ways to communicate the results. Um, some of them are, are very, you know, sometimes you write a report just like you would with science, sometimes you do a presentation, and sometimes you can make really cool dashboard toys. Um, so another point of similarity is this idea of having like an elastic toolbox of being able to add new things. Um, and one thing that I hear a lot, so, uh, oh, I didn't, I didn't even mention this part. So, Datascope is, right now, we're developing a boot camp to train new data scientists. And so, um, Kaplan has hired us to design the program and teach the first course. So I've been talking to a lot of people lately who are interested in data science and have questions about it, and have gotten to know a little bit about what some common misconceptions are, or what some, you know, what people's expectations are that are a little bit wonky. Um, and people ask, you know, well, what kind of algorithms do you use? You know, are you using, you know, hidden labels and this kind? And it, somebody always has a, a it has some algorithm that they just know that we're using, right? And I usually don't remember um, the algorithms that we use. You know, from from project to project, it's different. It's whatever is appropriate for the tool set. The clients aren't impressed by it, so by the time that we're you know showing them what they did, I forgotten that it's important you know it's some you can spot once in a while there's like a, a a nerd fan in the clients and you always remember for that guy you're like yeah I've got your hidden markov chain on this one oh yeah I love that one um, but for the most part you know you do what you need to get the job done um, and, uh, and sometimes it involves learning new things on the fly for the next project so here's a, uh, a couple of examples um, and I think that the interesting thing, and uh, that when Vince introduced me, I think he said that I'm going to tell you about some problems that we solved. And I'm thinking and thinking, and I don't know of any time that someone gave us a problem to solve and we solved it, which is really weird, you know, because that's what I kind of thought I did. But when I try to think of an example of it, I don't, I don't have it. You know, I, um, we find patterns in the data and, and we give them back to them. We might make recommendations, but we're also always like, giving them, empowering them to look through the stuff that they already own. Um, and I think that that is a really, uh, uh, to use the word empowering again, but I can tell you, you know, that, that the percentage of things that have to do with such and such is, is 24. You're like, okay, great. Um, but most of the people I work with are domain experts. You know, they've been doing what they do for a long time, and if they can dig into what I said and see why, or see a little bit more, a lot of times they can find a lot more value. A lot of times they'll think of something else this could do and ask me to do it. So we're actually setting ourselves up for continuing business by letting them play around with it a little bit more. So if I just say 24%, then there's not really much else to do. So this is another dashboard, and this is where we had to get good at search which was not what we had intended to do when we started planning out this project. Um, but <laughs> uh, what this does is, what does this say? Okay, so this is a project where we are uh, scraping the internet. If you've never scraped the internet, it's really, really fun to do. You just take information that doesn't belong to you, and you organize it, 
and it's awesome. Um, so we scrape a whole bunch of websites and um, collect all the comments. We break them down into sentences. We cluster them um, to have oops, similar content. And um, we give them, in this one, these are raw, this is a raw search, but in a different screen on here, um, it would have uh, you know, 346 sentences like this, and it would have the representative sentence, and then they can actually click through and check our math, right? And that's fun too, because um, clustering uh, English language is kind of messy. Uh, and there will be things in that cluster that don't look anything like, they're, they're, I mean, they're misses. For a human, it's a miss, right? For the computer, it's like, oh, these are the most closely uh, located cluster sentences in this cluster. Um, and some of them will, will have that magic of like seeming correct to my, to my human eyes, and some of them won't. And uh, we let them look. You know, sentiment analysis is another area where everybody wants it. Nobody really knows how crappy it is. Uh, it has a lot of limitations. And um, we tend to show our clients what's going on, let them play with it, and let them see. And then we don't have anything to hide from them. And then they get to, well, actually, their buddies. So their, their friends who have hired the other data scientists said, oh, our sentiment is done. They're saying, well, you know, this really has some serious limitations and they can speak intelligently about it and they feel really cool. So, um, I think the point of this time is that we learned a uh, search for this one um, and a lot about kind of a user interaction. Um, at the end, I'll talk a little bit about iterative design and I really love iterating because sometimes what the client thinks you're making and what you think you're making sounded exactly the same the last time you met but then by the time it's finished, uh, nobody understands what the other person was talking about. Um, so it's always great to check in, and um, building search strings is something that's uh, weird. Uh, people have expectations of how things are going to work, uh, and you have to be able to accommodate a lot of them and find them accurate information based on what they're saying. Um, and you know, we started out not even knowing that was a thing, and then that's something that we're adding to our toolbox as we go along. Uh, this is another, this is a really cool project that we got to do. Um, and sometimes the tools that we're adding are technical tools, and sometimes we're learning more about uh, kind of the systems in which these tools have to work. Uh, so e-discovery, it sounds like it's already automatic, but it just means um, discovery is if you're in a, uh, in a courtroom case and you are bringing in information, you have to like show somebody else what you're using so it's a fair game. And then E just means that it's electronic information. So this is like primarily emails. So you're finding em emails that are pertinent to a case and you have to separate emails that are pertinent to those that aren't. So there we go, it's a classification problem, right? Um, so we were talking to this company, Dejas, that does e-discovery uh, and we thought that they were going to ask us to do the classification, but they wanted something else that was really not fun at all. And we said, no, really, please let us do this classification thing. It's going to be super cool. And they said, no, you can't do it. And we're like, why not? And the key was that you don't just have to separate the relevant ones from the irrelevant ones. You have to prove that you've done that, which is a totally different thing. You have to show the judge and the opposing counsel that what you did to separate the relevant ones from the irrelevant ones was valid. And there was nobody yet who had been able to both classify them and explain how they did it so that, you know, Judge Joe would understand. So that became our problem here, is how do we both talk about it, how do we both do the classification and then allow someone who used the tool to describe exactly what they did to somebody else. Um, and so this is a really, fun, fun, fun project to do. Um, and the other part of this that, that makes this so valuable is um, because they couldn't automate it, they had to be read by lawyers. They had to have people who had gone to law school spending time reading and thinking, and it's so expensive. So like the, mar the amount of money to be saved here was just 
enormous. And we went, we put that right on the thing so that people would see how amazing it was being reinforcing using our services every time we touched it. Um, and yeah, so we put a lot of different elements into it. Uh, it ended up working. Uh, it is used not that often because of other drama. Other drama happens in that thing is lame, but um, the tool worked and they liked it and it, it was in court, which is the coolest thing ever. Yeah, question? So 64% of the one score, isn't it kind of low? Uh, and we still were happy with it? <laughs> it's just barely above the chance. Uh, of yeah, oh, oh, right. All we had to do was do better than humans were doing. So fortunately, even lawyers who've gone to law school who cost a bunch of money, they are not perfect. Um, so we had to do better than the lawyers, and that was uh, successful. And I'm not sure. So you have like Oh, 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 right, right. So what this does is um, the way that it works is uh, it doesn't do it all itself either. That's the other thing, is that um, we do a lot of things that, like the dashboard, that it does some analysis and leaves some rest for the humans to do. So this is a technology assisted review. It reduced the amount of eyeball time needed by I think like 94%. And it had some that were, you know, it has some dead ringers that are done. And then the rest of them are put in a very small pool for the lawyers that they expect the eyeballs to actually look at. So, so how did you how did you evaluate that uh, uh, this ninety four percent reduction in the amount of time needed? Uh, how did you did you have like a computer human computer interaction experts working? Did you set up a study or uh, where does that number come from? The number came from uh, that ninety four percent of the documents were um, were classified to a predetermined threshold of certainty. And when those are sampled, they were um, satisfactory. Uh, and I can get you more details, but I don't have them all the time. Um, okay. So when, when you do a, a, a thing like this, do you find yourself fighting with some technical person in the company who thinks they can do this or they can do it better, or they feel threatened by your, uh, your solution? Uh, I've experienced few technical threats. Um, sometimes there are people who are just weird and you find out that they think you're going to take their job. Exactly. Um, sometimes, uh, but it, it's usually not on technical grounds. Um, people usually don't want to step towards there, so they'll try something else. Um, so it might be, um, this isn't going to work, Sheila's not going to let you have the data, um, this person's, you know, it's good. they're looking for reasons that it'll fail. Um, and oftentimes, um, I mean, if they have a lot of power in the situation, usually the project doesn't happen. Um, usually, the, I can't think of any situations where that was the case. It's usually there's one very squeaky wheel and everybody else is getting stuff done and having a good time. Um, yeah. But on technical grounds, I don't remember. Oh, okay. This is actually an example of the time we solved a problem that is true. All right, so this one is called uh, change management. And change management is uh, if your company, well, I guess you could do change management in any size company, but say that you wanted to change from, you wanted a new license, like you're doing a, a major upgrade in some software that people use. Uh, you have to have new licenses. Not everybody's ready to switch right now. They have important work to do, so you're not going to force them. So for a while, you're going to have people, uh, you're going to have two licenses open. Um, so at a small company, that's kind of annoying. At a big company, that's like millions of dollars a month that you're just bleeding while people are using the old software instead of the new software. Um, so this is a, like, a problem that a lot of companies are really interested in doing more efficiently. So we worked with Procter & Gamble. Um, they had uh, contacted a company that does some survey research, and they had like a pretty cool, clever way to uh, target, to try and do this in a better way. So from earlier studies that they've done of other change management, um, when you get the new 
software, there's usually some training involved, and people are doing the training, and they notice that uh, the adoption uh, tended to, uh, that, that who the trainer was tended to be a, or the trainer trainer actually, was a factor in, in how quickly they switched, right? So they think that if they get better, to make sure all the trainer trainers are good, the switching will be more efficient. So they contacted the Clever survey company and they had questions to ask people like um, when you think the server is down, who do you go and check with? Who do you, who do you ask if their server is also down? Who do you ask for advice when you, your thing is broken? So they got these kind of organic models of who are the trusted sources of technical information in their company. So they had all these ratings of these people, but there were 11,000 of them. Um, so then it was a data science problem. If it was 10 people in a company, they'd be like, okay, everybody trusts Paul, Paul's the guy. Um, but with 11,000, it was too much, and so they called us in to help with this. So we used a number of different uh, networking models, like social networking models, and um, found a number of different optimized teams. We also had to work within their constraints. Uh, they had to have certain um, kind of department people. They had to be uh, spread across the continents in which this company operates in a certain ratio, and these other things that I don't remember what they were. Um, but so we had like this uh, of all possible teams of trainer trainers. You know, we had our, our top possible one, and then the rest of them were ranked. And the very best we could do with our own and uh, with our own models and with their constraints. Uh, the team that we went with was, we would judge it to be like a 94th percentile team. You know, with no restraints, we could have done a little bit better, had a few more better trusted trainer trainers, um, but we did, got 94th percentile. Um, the really cool thing about this, which at first was the really terrifying thing about this, uh, was that when we compared our picks to their picks, they had the managers go ahead and through like traditional means, of just them just saying, you know, you, you're gonna do the training, thank you. Um, they were anti-choosing, according to our models. Their their picks were in the sixth percentile of the trust model that we had built, and people panicked, they're like, oh my god, our model's wrong. And then they did like a, a quick sample and called the managers and said, okay, you said Billy, and we said Jean, and so, what do you think about Jean? And they're like, oh, Jean! Oh, Jean's so quiet and everything about Jean, but everybody loves Jean. Jean would do a great job. They sampled people and over and over again. It was a person they didn't think of, uh, but it still made sense. So it turned out to be really, really valuable. Now everybody's question is, because you guys are scientists, <laughs> what were the results, right? How did the change management go? Was it better? And this is um, the heartbreaking part about doing data science and business. Nobody knows because nobody wants to spend money to, <laughs> to collect the data afterwards, right? Is that crazy or what? So that's the thing in this, when I was gonna get into uh, funding models and, and working with clients is um, you never know when it's over. So uh, we have this really cool story about how their choices were exactly wrong, and I really wanna say, and we were right, and we saved them $47 million, but I have no idea. I think it was good, they liked us, they hired us again to add us that it has to be success, right? I really would love to know the end of that. Okay, so that was our last tool set. I'm always learning new things, but good thing for me, as trained as a scientist, and we do that anyway. Um, so knowing that you can do that, and knowing that you're good at that, is great to walk into the room with that confidence, and people say, can you do this? Knowing that you can learn how to do that faster than most people, and that's why they're talking to you, is a real strength. Okay, so there's already some tools that we have in common. And uh, you might not know all of these. There are several things that I had different names for, and then I learned that I was that a different group of intellectual people were calling them other things. So you probably have more of these oops in your toolbox than you actually know. Um, so you come to the table with some already built tools and some of your favorites, uh, and that's great. <laughs> the other part of this is that uh, it's all well and good, but so much of what we do. My friend Greg, who is a data scientist at Grubhub, uh, I mean, this is like our big secret. Like our friends come and they're like, oh, what amazing deep learning are you? I hear Google's using this, what are you using? 
And a lot of times the honest answer is this project uses mostly applied counting, uh, where we count things and tell you the number of things that there were, various types of things. Um, and that is really valuable to find, um, which is crazy. I, the, the other favorite example I had, I've told the, I have one about the list of names that I've used up too much today, but there's another company in Chicago called Food Genius, and they were giving a talk about what they do. They teamed up with Grubhub. Grubhub like, gave them all their data, all their menu data, and said, here, find some value in there. So they came and gave a talk at our Data Science Chicago meetup, and all the nerds were just like, oh my god, blow my mind with what you did with all this ingredient data. I bet it's the coolest thing ever. And so they're going on, and they said, OK, so on this slide, we uh, you can put in a word. So someone tell me an ingredient word. And someone's like, bacon, obviously. Uh, so they put in bacon. And then it gave them like all these adjectives that were next to bacon, and it ranked them, and it was an applied counting problem, right? So it was like applewood bacon, cherrywood bacon. It didn't even have like smoked applewood bacon, because that's an extra letter, and it would have complicated everything by, you know, blowing it out the side of the, the database, right? So just one adjective and a list of them. And we're like, okay, where's the cool part? And they're like, this is the cool part. And we're like, that's not that cool. And they're like, I'll tell you what. It's they chopped off all of them at the top three. And they said, this is the state of the art right now. If Applebee's wants to know what they need to name things, they hire a company. The company gives them three slides, a three-slide PowerPoint deck, has these three adjectives on it, and they charge them $80,000 for it. And that's why this is cool, because it keeps going, you can type whatever you want in it, it's a subscription service. So, Oh my gosh, so applied counting will get you a really far away, and it depends on what you want. Um, you can do cool things with applied counting too. Did anybody see this one? The, um, the Twitter map? It's really cool. So this is a sexy histogram. It's just the number of tweets bitten into geographical areas. And this right here is the, um, this is the USA Portugal game, and this is game time. So it's like, I don't know how, it's maybe like one, slot a minute and you get to or per second and you see all the tweets and then right here is where the USA scores and you see the whole nation erupting with tweets and you know the text with it oh gosh it's so annoying it's always happened <sighs> and the text is like and when they score the goal it literally goes off the charts and I'm like oh yeah where is the y-axis there isn't a y-axis they never put a y-axis on there because you don't have to do anything right to do something really cool but I digress um, it was not that many, and then it was way more. So, no. <laughs> okay. so those are the similarities. If you want to be a data scientist, you already have a lot going for you. There's some things that you need to prepare for, and through this talk, you should already be prepared for the biggest bummer of data science, and it's the client. They are weird. They don't care about things that matter. They do care about things that don't matter. And um, we have like a few of the uh, common complications with a client. Um, clients don't know what they need. So that's a big one. Like they're going to come, I'm really good at this algorithm and all these clients are going to want it because it applies to their problem. They have no idea what problems apply to their problem. They don't know what their problem is. They have this data. They hear that it's worth something and they're going to like bring it to you. They're spilling out the sides. They've like lost part of it already. Um, so you're going to have to educate them that you can help them and make them money a lot of the time. Um, and then when you do that, sometimes they won't believe you and you have to um, use metaphor and like, hand puppets, but not insult them, you know, just like really stop the hand puppets until they understand what you're saying and what they're saying. Um, and then this one is that not everybody has the same idea about what should be going on. So you can have this one guy who like, perfect client, he gets it, he understands what you're talking about, he's eager, you know, and he doesn't need it to go his way, he's ready to listen to what you have to say, but then there's all these other people, and, and this guy has a different agenda, and this guy has a different agenda, and uh, I don't even have a solution to that one, but it happens, um, and that's that. Um, and then there's, there's just like the language. So I started going to a lot of meetups, a lot of like uh, entrepreneurial drink things and just talking to people because they talk funny and I'm supposed to know what they're talking about and it doesn't always make sense. 
Um, so the onus is on us to figure out what they're talking about and to explain what we're talking about because we want their money. Um, but it'll happen. So in this one, yeah. Um, yeah, and just because, so this one is amazing. You can have, you can be like, well, your company will save millions and millions of dollars. It's, I can't believe you've been collecting this. It's pristine. We just put this and this together and you're going to beat every other company in your entire sector. Like, let's go. And they'll say, oh, we can't. And they will, if you make that happen, you'll be the hero. They'll make you like president of everything. And it's just, you just can't. And that's crazy. Uh, but it happens. Um, and then there are, well, that's one should have gone the other one. Um, <laughs> there are people who think that they are already doing big data uh, and, and, they're, and they're not. So it's kind of the opposite. It's not like, what's my problem? It's like, oh, my problem solved. And you're like, actually, there's way more beyond that linear regression that you're doing. And they're like, yeah, we're fine. And like, okay, great. Okay, so there are lots of issues. And there are ways to, I mean, some of these are kind of intractable. Uh, there are ways to like push on them. There are ways to tap dance. There are ways to cajole and flatter. Um, and we have found um, the most helpful to be to involve clients in the design. Um, and we do interact, uh, iterative rounds of design with them. Uh, we start from their problem. We get them to talk about solutions. I mean, I should tell you guys all about our ideation workshops. We, I mean, there's so much to talk about, but uh, that's really limited. I mean, there's nothing like getting a, um, like a CTO of a giant company and handing him some crayons and telling him to draw what you want, what he wants, you know, the dashboard to look like. And it comes out awful. And like the guy over there is kind of like snickering and everyone's bonding. And, and it's great because people, you know, when, when they have that like humiliation for a purpose, there's so much buy-in, you know, and they understand the problem from like a deeper level. And when you get to, you know, time to deliver the deliverable, uh, that's a word you have to learn, deliverable. Um, you know, it's theirs, it's ours, you know? Um, and they've already participated in, you know, debugging things before it's even finished. Um, so I think that's one of the best ways is to work with clients as much as possible instead of like at them. Um, my other favorite secret trick is to pretend you're not selling them anything at all and pretend you're training them to do it. And then they go back and they're so excited and they fail. And then they're really, really ready to hire you. That's great. Uh, so this is an example of uh, iterative design and a series about crayons. I use crayons all the time. Uh, I was really grown up with me. I used a like a felt tip pen for this for this presentation. Um, so this looks like garbage and it looks crazy. Uh, but then here's the next iteration where we made a really simple wireframe. I don't think this one works. I think it's just a traditional wireframe. Um, but you can see how it's like, oh, there's really similar elements, but that one doesn't look so crazy. Um, and this costs, I mean, what did that cost to make? Like $3 um, instead of, and it took, you know, while they're standing there, you did it. You can hand it to them and they can leave. Um, and then here's the finished product. Um, so that looks crazy, but it's actually pretty much exactly what we did. Um, and it was finished and they gave us feedback on it. Um, so I think that that's all I had time for today. I really thank you guys for your attention.